Sci-Fi Buzz commentator Harlan Ellison invited us over recently to meet Dittmar winner Terry Dowling. A Dittmar, by the way, is the Australian equivalent of a Hugo. Terry has won nine of them. Terry, how, how many works have you done now? Three so far, three collections. Now, am I correct that the first one, which is called Rhinoceros, which is a story cycle, was called the work of a brilliant writer by Locus, the, the leading newspaper of the science fiction world? They were, they were generous. Um. Well, in, in fact, you're being, you're being humble, because what they said was that you were as good as Cordwainer Smith, and they said, Cordwainer Smith, come again. Now, how does it feel to be a talent of remarkable quality, totally ignored in America? This is what, uh, well, I guess what we can really talk about here is the the population is larger here, so you usually pitch to the largest buying market, yeah. demographic-wise. Australians buy more books than the American population per capita. So um, we tend to be more difficult to read. I think that's what I'm discovering. Are you saying that science fiction in Australia is more complex, deeper, more philosophical? Is that uh, Writers like Damien Broderick. Uh, difficult writer, very idiosyncratic, very quirky, uh, and myself, I must admit, um, the Americans therefore see you as the publishers, as challenging, which is a nice uh -huh. way of talking about it. Okay, well now, the reason you're being interviewed by Sci-Fi Buzz is because this week, your book, Rhinoceros, miraculously, has been picked up by the Science Fiction Book Club. Yes, it has. I mean, you've done an amazing thing. A book that was not published in America in any way, in any form. They've taken it for a hardcover. So you're, so you're now over here in America. Are you going to try and write for the American audience? Or are you going to maintain your standards and write for the audience? I'd like to try and stay with the standard for a while that I'm keeping. I don't want to uh, come down, because I know I can. Uh, in Australia, they analyze my work as being first-year postgrad standard of English. Really? Yeah, which shocked me, because I didn't think it was that hard. But it's that trend towards subliteracy. Uh, people do not read as comfortably as they used to, so you've got to water down the level of English. And boy, we lose a lot. We lose a lot. We can't use the word er, e double -R, r. We have to say made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't go around saying I erred. People say you erred what? Uh. So, so um, the language is becoming debased, and we're using more words to say fewer things. And uh, I don't like doing that. I, I like to leave it to the reader to help me in the making, just like you do. So, um, well, you're also a musician, aren't you? And use cadence and rhythm yeah. very much. So I read a passage aloud to see how it sings. And I think that's part of the secret. I think that's part of the magic. For the last, I don't know, 35, 40 years, I have been friends with a man named Julius Schwartz. He hates being called Julius. Julie Schwartz. Fabled living legend, the DC editor who reinvented the Flash, Green Lantern, the Justice Society as the Justice League. Uh, Julie was uh, a science fiction fan, then he became uh, a science fiction agent. And he was an agent from the years 1934 to 1944. And amazingly enough, this man, whom I am very touching now, this man was the first agent Ray Bradbury ever had. Tell us about your meeting with Ray Bradbury, Julie. Well, there I was at the first World Science Fiction Convention in 1939. And this fellow, who I did not know, I may have heard of him, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I am going to be a writer and I want you to be my agent. But I said, my boy, I said, I only represent professionals. He said, someday I will be a professional. I'm willing to write a story a week until you sell one for me. I said, okay, go ahead and do it. Unfortunately, it took a little more than a year, but 1941, when I was about to leave for California with my friend Edmund Hamilton, yes. I received a check for this Ray Bradbury. And rather than mail it, I figured we would drive there before it would, the, the check would get there. Who, who bought the story and how much was it? Well, let me tell a little bit more. It, this is television. This well, is not I, the theater. We, we have, haven't I'm, got three I'm acts I'm coming here. to the dramatic part. All right. So Ed and I arrived in, Calif in Los Angeles, got a place to live, and we decided to go out and get something to eat. We were hungry. We walked down the street, and there's a young fellow selling newspapers on the corner. Hey, get your Los Angeles Times. Get your Los Angeles Herald as the car passes. And we look, and what is now known as a double or triple take, it's Ray Bradbury. So he rushed over, and I said, Ray, I have good news for you. I have a check for the first story you sold. I sold, it was called The Pendulum. It sold to Super Science Stories and received one half penny a word. I think the whole check came for $35. $35. Divided, he collaborated with, so I think, yeah, I made about uh, 74 cents on that deal. 
That wasn't one of your big numbers. That was a big, but it was the start of Ray Bradbury's career, and I sold his next 69 stories. Now, okay, now it comes 1944, and you get a call from a buddy of yours, Mort Weisinger. No, I got a call from one of my clients named Alfred Bester. Was it Alfie Bester who got you in at D.C.? Oh, absolutely. Alfred Bester was writing Green Lantern at the time. And he was writing comics because there weren't enough science fiction markets to earn a living. Mm. So as a consequence, as an Asian, a 10 percenter, I wasn't either. So he suggested I go down to All-American Comics, which is sort of a branch of D.C., and apply for the job. I protested. I said, I've never read a comic. I don't know what they're all about. He says, buy a few comics, read them, and go down. So I invested 30 cents. That much? I bought three comics. That's the only money I ever spent on comics in my life. <laughs> 30 cents. But it paid dividends. I went down, was interviewed by Shelley Mayer, who was the editor-in-chief, and I was hired on that day, February 21st, 1944, and I've been there ever since. It's now in my the, golden anniversary. In the middle, was it in the middle 60s that you uh, built, rebuilt the, the Silver Age? Uh, 1955 was the beginning of the Silver Age. See, what had happened was uh, there had been a lot of witch hunting and people saying comic books are bad for kids. There was a book called Seduction of the Innocent by uh, Dr. Frederick Wortham, one of the great loonies of our time. There was the uh, the Kefauver crime hearings, and all of a sudden, the bottom fell out of comics, and there were no more superheroes, and there were no more crime comics, and there were no more horror comics, and it was all very mild. A lot of companies went out of business. Many years later now, comes Julie at DC, and he says, I think I'm going to bring back these costumed heroes. He recreated The Flash. Oh, well, first we're going to try it out. Oh, We right. had a magazine called Showcase, and if that, mag that issue sold, we know we had something. Well, here's the point that many of our viewers may not understand. When a magazine appears on a newsstand, we don't know how that magazine did till four or five months later. Now, if you printed the magazine on a regular monthly basis, you printed five magazines, and they all turned out to be a disaster. So we have a showcase. We try one issue, wait four months to see what happens. So showcase number four, reintroduce the Flash. And all I kept from the Flash was the title and the super speed. Everything else was different. Four months later, a few months, four months later, we got the report, and so in showcase number eight, we had another flash, showcase number 12, and so on. At that point, they said, let's go ahead and put out the flash. It became a success, and they said, uh, Julie, what would you like to try next? Green well, Lantern. a real favorite of mine was Green Lantern, Green especially Lantern. since Alfred Bester wrote it, it got me into it. Uh -huh. That proved to be a success with the change. I reintroduced the Justice Society of America, but I called it Justice League. Society is a terrible name. It sounds like a social club, a league. It's a baseball league, a f football league, a basketball league. That proved to be a success, followed by the Hawkman and followed by the Atom. All right, so now, Julie, my boy, we come through the mists of time. We come forward. This is your life. You were the Superman editor at DC for how many years? Oh, about 16, from about 1971 to 1985, 86, I don't recall exactly. How many times did you kill him off? Uh, I never killed him off. He, it, hey, it, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. It may have seemed he was killed. Oh, he had never died. Oh, I see a cover that would say, in this issue, Superman dies. Mm, mm, but he didn't really. Apparently, apparently. Apparently he died. Because I started the story on page one and ended on page 23 usually, and the story was over, so right. Superman had an unforeseen accident. Right. And everyone thought he was dead. Uh -huh. At the end, we saw... He was not dead. He was not dead. Unlike Even though at the end, it said the end. But that... that did uh, not apply to Superman, not uh, apply unlike, to the story. Uh, right. Right. Unlike okay. the current situation in which he was dead, but he's not dead. What's the finest moment, the finest moment you ever had in the world of science fiction? Oh, God. Oh. You can't think on your feet? Well, You're I'm a living down legend. On a living legend should think on If I was standing on, on my feet, I've had so many great moments. Okay. All right, okay, here's the oh, moment. I figured we'd get it. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting in my office with Kate Swan and Murphy Anderson, who were doing my Superman and Jeanette Kahn, who's the president of, the, of DC Comics, sent in her administrative assistant, as they call it now, and said, everyone into the conference room, this is very important, drop whatever you're doing. So I look at Murphy, and I look at Kate, and we're all wondering, and I say, uh-oh, this is it. You're all going to get Mar canned. Marvel has finally taken us over, or DC is going out of business. This is the worst moment of my life. <laughs> and got into the room, and on a long table were four bottles of champagne. Boy, this is really the toasting us and letting sending us open style. A few moments later, Jeanette Kahn comes in, holding a magazine clenched to her, and she announced to one and all that this is Julie's 70th birthday, and we prepared a surprise for him. And the surprise was this, and there's an issue of Superman, 
<clears throat> in which I appear on the cover and Superman is flying in with a birthday cake to wish me happy birthday. Well, I thought it was just a cover gig, but I turned, it in, turned the cover over and the, the story is about me. So that, I guess, is certainly one of the super best moments of my life. Tomorrow will mark another milestone for Julie Schwartz. He will celebrate 50 full years with DC Comics. Happy anniversary, Julie.